a couple verses there. You may have heard me in the past few weeks just say, and I've said this for many years, but God does have expectations for us as a believer. The way some Christians live, though, they say, well, now that I'm saved, I don't have to do anything else. I'm going to heaven. That's all I need. Well, I hope and pray that you truly are born again. That's what it hinges on. It's not a feeling. It's not an emotion. It's not a religious ritual. It's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. If you have that, praise God, heaven is yours. But I have a problem with someone who uh, has that attitude. Because if you're truly born again, there is going to be a change in your life. You're going to want to honor the Lord. You're going to want to live for the one who saved your soul. But here's the question. What does God really want? What does God <laughs> expect from me? What does God expect from you? Micah has some uh, great insight here. We're going to look at verse 6. Micah 6, 6, 7, and 8 there. And we're going to, verse 8 is really the text, but uh, we'll focus on some other verses as well. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He shall show thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require? What doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and walk humbly with thy God? Our Heavenly Father, as we look into your word here, though this is a passage that's very familiar to most of us, a passage I've preached from before, but God, may this today, may it really uh, use this truth to zero in on our own hearts. May we not try to cover up and try to justify, but may we truly see ourselves where we stand and what, if we are doing what you would have us to do, if we are what you want us to be. So you have your way, for it is in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now our text is really one of the most famous in the Old Testament here. The Israelites were guilty. They were guilty of a lot of injustice. Uh, they were guilty of ingratitude toward God. I, again, I think that there's a sin that seems to be prevalent in the nation today, in the world. It's ingratitude. And, uh, but the Lord asked his people here in verse 3, what have I done unto thee? What have I done? And they expressed their desire in verse 6 that they wanted to be at peace with God, but at the same time, they show their level of forgiveness and their ignorance. Look again, verse 6. They're talking about coming to the Lord. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? And they forgot that what God told them earlier in the word. They forgot what in Deuteronomy chapter 10, <coughs> verse 12, how they were to come before the Lord. Listen to this. And now Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee, but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all of his ways, and to love him and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. I thought the Sunday school lesson Brother Morris taught this morning goes well with the message here as well. But they were obviously, these people in, in Malachi or Micah's time were obviously ignorant of how to come before God. Look at verse 7. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Should I give my firstborn for my transgression? I mean, you can see the ignorance in these people. Had they so soon forgotten who God is and what he does require? Um, and so God has often made it clear that to, that to obey is better than sacrifice. And they act as though they had to pay him off. So what will it, it take to motivate us to have that kind of intimate, committed relationship that God wants to have with each and every one of us. Again, what doth the Lord require of thee? What doth the Lord require of thee? Number one, God expects us to do justly. 
The Lord has some requirements here for his people, and the, the Hebrew word translated require, it carries the idea to search for or to look for. It's like the, the requirements that a job may have to have that job. They post a job at work, and they also put the requirements for that job. The personnel department is looking for someone who meets those requirements, who has those qualifications. And that's kind of the meaning here of this word, what the Lord requires of us. God requires or he expects, or he expects us to live up to what we already know. You know, sometimes we worry about, well, I just don't know all the things about the Bible, and I don't know all those, the prophecy and all this or that. Listen, what do you know? We've sat in church for years, many of us, for some all of our life. All we can remember is sitting in the pews of the church on Sunday, hearing the preaching of the gospel, hearing it being taught in Sunday school. What, do you think we would be different if we would be, have been, or just do what we know to do? If we would be obedient to the truths that we've heard already, rather than what we don't know? I, yes, I, I, I would say it's good that we all have a desire and a hunger to know more and to be more, but what about what we already know? Are we doing it? Are we obeying it? Well, the problem here with my, the people around Micah was that um, they were not. Uh, they, uh, uh, God, God wants us, what he requires is just to, but to do justly, to do justly. The people in Micah's time were, for the most part, doing the exact opposite. Uh, I, I don't have time to go through all of it. Look back in chapter 2, though, just a couple verses to point this out. The condition, the heart condition of these people in chapter 2 and verse 8. The Bible says here, even of late, my people is risen up as an enemy. He pull off the robe with the garment from them that pass by securely as men at, at verse from war. And just showing the heart of the people here, look over also in chapter 3 and verse 1. Chapter 3 and verse 1. Um, oh, let me just skip down to verse 2. Who hate the good and love the evil, who pluck off their skin from off them and their flesh from off their bones, who also eat the flesh of my people. It goes on, just the horrible uh, behavior of these people. <clears throat> chapter 6 also in chapter 7. Um, as well, look at a couple of verses there in chapter 7, and I'll be done just pointing these truths out. Verse 3, chapter 7, verse 3 that they may do evil with both hands earnestly. The prince asketh and the judge asketh for a reward, and the great men, he uttereth his mischief desire. So they wrap it up. The best of them is as a briar. The um, most upright is sharper than a thorn hedge. The day of thy watchman and thy visitation cometh. Now shall be their uh, perplexity. So the people were not dealing justly with one another. Justice doesn't damage the reputation of another individual. That's not justice. You know, a lot of people today, I guess maybe it's, you could say, well, it's the human nature. You're right. But as a Christian, we have someone who dwells within us to combat that human nature, to uh, be victorious over the human nature. But many humans love to gossip and they love to throw out innuendos and and you can damage the reputation of another person by just stating your opinion as fact. You said, no, wait a minute, preacher. We all have a right to our opinions. That is true. We all have our right, a right to our opinions, but we ought to challenge ourselves whether or not there's justice in what we are about to say or what we are saying. Is there justice? Justice doesn't defraud. Justice doesn't oppress. Justice does not try to destroy another individual. Um, and think about it. We can see something, hear something, and then we start fit, trying to fill in the blanks. And then we, we talk to someone else and we tell them, oh, did you hear what I heard? Did you see this? And, but we don't know all the facts. If we have a, a question, if we have a problem with a brother or sister, let's go to them. Ask them about what's going on. 
If you want to take your Bibles, keep your finger there in Micah, but go all the way back to the Old, or, or excuse me, the New Testament, all the way back to 1 John. 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. This is how we ought to um, be living. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5. This then is the message. I love when John here, he doesn't say this might be the message. I, I think it's one of the messages. No, he said this is it. He, he uses that phrase over and over in 1 John. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we what? Lie. We lie. And do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth, cleanseth us from all sin. Now here's some where we're, how we can apply it to our lives. Are, are we living the way that we know we should live? Are you living the life that you should live? Or has sin crept its way back into your life? And that's, that can happen to any of us. Are you committed to doing those things that God has taught you already in the Word of God, that you have learned from the Word of God, um, or have you left off from doing them? Uh, put them aside. Maybe you're thinking for one day, not now. Uh, according to 1 John chapter 5, verse 7 that we just read, your freedom from the power and the consequences of sin is wholly determined on your commitment to right living. Let me read that again. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, that's 1 John 5, 7. We have fellowship one with another. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. So here's what God wants for us to do justly. It implies a decision has been made. Uh, uh, Deuteronomy, uh, and I'm going to have you turn with, with me to some of these scriptures. I want you to see them this morning. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Again, Mark and Micah, because we will be, I believe, hopefully come back there. But Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 19. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. I think it does us well to read the scriptures to see, to hear what God is saying directly. It implies a decision has been made to say to do justly. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is the life, or thy life, and the length of thy days. Decide to live the way that God wants you to live. Again, children are oftentimes guilty when we uh, uh, point out some error in them. They say, well, my, may point to their brother or sister. Well, they did it. Or my friends at school, they did it. They do that. But us adults, we do the same thing to God. And they say, well, everybody else is living this way. Listen, decide to live the way that God wants you to live. Decide to be faithful to prayer, faithful to Bible reading, faithful to God's house. No matter what others are doing, make that decision. Do justly. Decide to live your, your uh, and, and, and the way God wants you to live and give of your time and your talent as well as your treasure to the Lord. That's what God wants us to do, to do justly. Decide to love the Lord with all your heart. And to love others as well. So then to do justly, the second point about I, I, I have here is it requires an ongoing commitment. Not, not only does it imply a decision has been made, but also this ongoing commitment. A commitment to do the right thing no matter what the consequences. Now, um, too many times they'll say, well, yeah, but if I do that, I know it's the right thing. I know it's what God wants me to do. But if I do that, it's going to cost me. It may cost me a friendship. It may cost me a position. It may bring some persecution upon me. And so here, let me just give you this point here. Commitment to doing the right thing always disallows for situational ethics. Well, I'll do right. But if this happens in this situation, 
And if everything happens this way, I can't do that, Lord. Now, you see, you commit to do right no matter what, no matter what the situation is. Uh, when one is committed to doing the right thing, they'll do it no matter what others think, what others want them to do, what, no matter what others do. They will do the right thing even if it means persecution, even if it means uh, being ridiculed and, and have retribution brought upon yourself. Turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 11, 11 and 12. Matthew 5, 11 and 12. <clears throat> the word blessed here in Matthew chapter 5 are happy. Happy are ye, Matthew 5, 11, when men shall revile you and persecute you. Now this sounds like an oxymoron here. This does not sound right. Happy is a man who's persecuted, who's reviled. And shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. And that's the key right there. Uh, there's no truth in what they say. They're doing that because of Jesus' sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, in verse 12 it says. For great is your, your reward in heaven. For, as, uh, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Now, go with me to the book of Luke chapter 12. Luke 12, verses 4 and 5. Luke 12. And verses 4 and 5, where Jesus says unto them there, Be not afraid of them that kill the body. I... Look, I understand the fear in this world. I understand we are human. I, I understand the element of fear of death. Um, I, I have often said it's not the matter of dying that scares me. It's a matter of how it's going to happen. Uh, but, but listen, we are not to be afraid of them that can kill the body. I, I think we could even include the coronavirus in there, right? I, I think we could even include cancer in there. Whatever other disease or sickness or or a thing that can actually kill the body. Don't be afraid of that. And after that, they have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. And so do justly requires this ongoing commitment. God expects you to live up to what you already know. Listen, if you've been saved Five years, you know a lot, you've heard a lot, you should be living up to it. If you've been saying 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, 60 years, boy, we should be living justly. I know it's, those are just words, but they're powerful words from the word of God. This is what he expects of us, to do justly. You and I cannot do justly if we do not have, the, or we're not applying the word of God to our own lives. And secondly, God expects you, according to what Micah states there, to love mercy. God expects you to treat others right. Now, for this, I'd like to go to a New Testament scripture in the book of Mark, chapter 12. Mark, chapter 12. And verse 28. God expects you and I to treat others right. But they, you don't know what they did to me, preacher. That, that doesn't, isn't taken into account. God expects you and I to treat others right. So, um, well, here I just closed. I'm sorry about that. Mark chapter 12. I gave you, you plenty of time now to get there. And verse 28, Mark 12, 28. And here this, this, the scripture says, and one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is light, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment given uh, than, than these. And, and uh, um, oh, let me read that again. There is one other commandment 
There is none other commandment greater. I'll get it straight yet. There is none other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said unto him, Well, master, thou hast said the truth. And there is one God, and there is none other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, and with all the soul, with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all uh, whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art uh, not far from the kingdom of God, and no man uh, after this does, does ask him any question. Well, we heard a good explanation of that uh, truth in Sunday school class. But God does expect us to love mercy. God does expect us to treat others. I know it's a high mark, isn't it, to love your neighbor as yourself. I, I know right now you say, yeah, I love my neighbor as myself. They're great neighbors. But I'm sure all of us at one time or another wanted to kill our neighbor. <laughs> Maybe not actually kill them, but uh, they got, we just got frustrated with them. Maybe they did something. Maybe it's their dog barking all night long. And uh, we just wanted to at least kill the dog. Um, and there's, but people can get on our nerves. I know that's true. But listen, this high calling, that's what God wants us to strive for, to shoot for that mark of loving mercy, of doing right, treating others right, uh, no matter what. It has the idea of abundant mercy of kindness. In other words, it's unusual in its quality. Um, it can easily be perceived as God-like. This kind of love, this kind of uh, kindness uh, is not human nature. And so forgiveness and compassion are two expressions of this kindness. It forgives a wrong and it has compassion even on the person that has wronged them. Again, that's not natural. That's not normal, uh, humanly speaking. Mercy or, or loving kindness seeks ways to mend re relationships, fellowship, not to divide. Mercy or loving kindness puts personal wrongs behind it and moves to love God and to love people. So kindness seeks ways to help people with legitimate needs. God, number one, expects you to love others. God expects you to demonstrate towards others the same kind of love that you have for yourself. And so the command to love others is the same, in the same way in which we love ourselves is especially important here in the context of family relationships. Uh, sometimes it can be easier to love those that we don't really know that well, but those that we are very close to. And I, I hope and pray that there's nothing like that in the families that are represented here today. But I know good and well, too many times I've been in situations where families were at each other's throats, who hated one another. In fact, you ask Cody, some of the most dangerous calls they'll get is domestic disturbances when families are fighting and it can be a very dangerous situation but now with that in mind turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5 again a familiar passage of scripture but I think the word of God gives us the answer here Ephesians chapter 5 and this definitely uh, speaks of the relationships here in the family look at verse 25 it says husbands this is Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife, wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. So I'll stop right there, but God expects you to forgive, to forgive others. And let that begin in the home. God expects the wife to forgive the husband. And there's a lot of times you'll have to do that. God expects the, the, the uh, 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 husband to forgive the wife, to forgive the children, to forgive others as well around you. But uh, this is what God requires or expects, uh, to love mercy. God expects you to extend the same kind of forgiveness that you would want given towards you. 
you want to be forgiven. Again, let's go to some other scriptures. Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, two verses there, 37 and 38. Luke 6, verse 37. Then we'll go to the book of Matthew, chapter 6 and 5. But Luke 6, 37. Judge not that ye shall not be judged. Condemn not that ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Now go to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 14 and 15. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. For if ye forgive men, Matthew 6, verse 14, I'll give, give you a little second here to find it. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. I think forgiveness is important in the eyes of God, is it not? Now look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 and 4. Matthew 5, verse 23 and 24. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar... And there, while you're at the altar, you rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee. Leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gifts. To obey is better than sacrifice. Get right with that brother or that sister. Make sure there's no problem there. Then come and offer your gift. So God expects you to forgive. And then God expects you to care. To care for others. It's easy in our world to get to a place where we really just don't care. Where we live in that cyber world. Where we can say what we want and there seems to be really no repercussions against us. That we can see all the things that are happening around the world and we can tune it out. Shut it off. And But God expects you and I, Christian, to care especially for one another. God expects you to give the same measure of care for the welfare of others that you expect to receive for yourself. You know what's sad is there are times where I've been around individuals who had no family, just no one around, and they were in great need. They were in the hospital, no one there, nursing home, no one come to see them. And, uh, and that, that's a sad thing. But... And I thought, boy, I, 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 don't, I hope that there's someone there when I am in that situation. Thankfully, I have experienced that, that there are others that come to my aid and are there by my side. How do you want to be treated? How do you want to be treated when you're flat on your back? When you're like the, good, the, uh, the fellow that fell in the ditch was beaten by those thieves and the Good Samaritan came along. Uh, don't you want to have a Good Samaritan? Don't you want to have a family member that loves you enough to, to sacrifice, to take the time to care. Well, that's how we should care for others. We live in a society that teaches us to look out for number one. Do whatever you have to do, just take care of number one. But if we spend all of our efforts looking out only for ourselves, what happens to those are uh, to those other individuals in life that are number two, that are number three, that are number four? Do you realize every individual that comes into our our life circle, it's, it's not a mistake, it's not a coincidence, it's not an accident. God has brought them into our path for a reason. You know how many times, how many people we, I'm sure you've seen, they maybe looked a little strange. They may look like they were not so clean, or maybe they looked like they were outcast from society. Do we care for that soul? Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For uh, this is the law and the prophets. Now, uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Just a few verses there I want you to see. Then we're going to go to the book of Romans. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. Matthew chapter 5, verses 43, we'll read down through uh, verse 48. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Now I say unto you, 
love your enemies. This is Jesus speaking. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his uh, son to, to rise on the evil and on the good. And sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Again, we know that we're not going to reach that level of perfection, but that's what we're to strive for, to be like him. Not like others, but like Jesus Christ. And then go to one more passage, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verses 9, oh, well, we may go down to verse 18 there, but verse 9, Romans 12, verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Don't, let it not be fake. Um, let it be real. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love to honor, preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, dist distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high, high things, but con condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Now, again, this is how uh, God wants us to love mercy. This is not a human response. We, our, our human flesh, we want to get even. We want to, we want to retaliate. But that's not what God tells us to do. You remember, we are uh, that light in the world, that God's light shines through us to the lost and dying world. Let them see Jesus. And I think this is the greatest way to do justly, to love mercy. Let me get to the last point here, and we'll be done. Number three, God expects you to walk humbly with thy God. God expects us to live each day in a committed relationship with him. I guess that begs the question, what kind of relationship do you have? Or do you have a relationship with God? To walk with God implies movement. It says here, and to walk. John 3, 8, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. To walk, it, it, there's some action involved here. Uh, to walk with God requires, or it does require some action on our part, our part towards the rest of the world. To walk with God implies progress. That progress comes through the submission of his leadership in our lives. And to walk humbly. There's that progress. Uh, Psalm 32.8. I will instruct thee. Oh, this is a, a great teaching of the word of God. The Lord said, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. And so here, uh, just to walk humbly before the Lord so that he can instruct us, so that he can teach us. You can't teach a person that knows everything. You, you can't guide a person and say, oh, don't worry, I know the way. I've got it. Uh, how many of us get had to eat some crow because, oh yeah, I know where I'm at, know what I'm doing, know where I'm going, and we got lost. But, um, but it's, more, it's a more serious thing when you're talking about your spiritual life. And so we have to humbly walk with God. And then to walk with God implies relationship. To walk humbly with, and there's that personal, thy God. Is he your God this morning? It implies this ongoing possessive relationship. Is God truly yours, or is, or is he some sort of abstract uh, influence on your life? Or, um, is he like uh, the, uh, the movies talk about the force be with you? He's just some force out there. 
No. Is he a God that you have a relationship with? Is your relationship with God, is it personal? Is it emotional? Is it intimately and passionate? Or is it mechanical? It, it, is your relationship with God very business-like? I, um, I do want you to turn with me to one more scripture, and I promise this will be the last. But John chapter 14, and we're done. Um, John chapter 14. John 14, verse 15. John 14, verse 15. If you love me, keep my what? Commandments. That's what Jesus said. If you really love me, keep my commandments. What he says and teaches in his word. And I uh, will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day, ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. And so we, what, what a great thing to talk about that relationship we have with God. With God. Do you have that? Is that a reality in your life? Are you 100% certain that if you died right now because of that relationship, you have eternal life and you're going to heaven? If not, get it settled. He has showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God? Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we love you. We are so thankful that we can come today. And, and yes, sometimes it does take a little bit of a rebuking from your word because we get so caught up in the things and the entangled in the affairs of this world that we get our eyes off of you and, and, and we forget really how to approach you and, and what you really want us to do. Lord, three basic things here today, but may we adhere to it. May we strive to be obedient so that you can bless us the way you want to, Lord. And so help us to definitely walk humbly with you and to love mercy and to, to be exactly what you'd have us to be. For we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.